Hi, everyone. This is First Draft Friday. I'm your host, Alessandra Torrey, with Authors AI. This is the fantastic Andy Maslin, who is joining us again. And we are continuing our last chat, which was about psychological thrillers. And many of you joining us today um, watch that chat or you watch the replay. So I'm really excited. I want to say from the very beginning, if you have any questions, don't be shy. We did not have a chance to get to everyone's questions last time. So we want to be sure that we can um, interact with you guys and answer as many questions as you have. So you have a chat box. Feel free to pop questions in, whether you're joining us from YouTube or from um, from Facebook. Please uh, don't be shy. So uh, Andy, before, well, do you want to just, in case they didn't join us last time, do you want to give a, a quick intro? Sure, I'll do a very, uh, hi everyone, nice to see you again, a really brief intro this time. So uh, my name's Andy, I'm based in Salisbury in England. I write now kind of three, uh, in three genres, vigilante, sort of revenge fiction, police procedurals set in the UK and now Sweden, and psychological thrillers. Earlier this year I felt like a change, I wrote my first one, which by the way is now being read by a publisher, so you're, you're kind of first to hear that, so you know, fingers crossed. Um, and I turned fully professional or fully full time two and a half years ago. So this is now how I support myself, just writing, writing novels. Writing novels, best job in the whole world. Absolutely. Um, so at, just as a, as a recap, if you did not watch this last time, we um, started off talking about the ingredients that are um, not, not exactly required, but um, common ingredients that exist in a psychological thriller and kind of the thing that separates it from a vigilante thriller or an action thriller or, or some other sort of thriller. So um, we talked about having an element of psychology, hence the name psychological thriller. We talked about um, the disordered mind, which is um, the protagonist, possibly the antagonist, having a sort of uh, perception distortion. Um, we also talked about secrets um, and keeping secrets from the audience and often from your main characters. And we talked about um, a domestic setting, which is where most of uh, psychological thrillers typically could happen to you. You know, you're not a super spy, you're not a billionaire, you know, or in a lab somewhere cooking up um, something uh, evil. It's normally an everyday person um, yeah. where the reader could really picture themselves. So those were the things we covered last week. And if you missed it, you can catch it on the podcast, um, on our YouTube channel, or uh, on our authors.ai blog. But um, but diving in today, we still have so much to talk about when it comes to psychological thrillers. So um, I know, Andy, I was thinking about this long after our conversation, and yeah. I, I know you were also. Um, so it uh, is what what are some of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about last time? Um, I think, I mean, really, one of the things we, we didn't get to talk about, and it is absolutely crucial to making this kind of book work, is the protagonists themselves, you know, the hero or heroine. Um, well, actually, let's stick with the Greek word um, protagonist because they aren't necessarily a good person. I mean, I've, I've just finished a book where the protagonist was, the protagonist was the villain, in fact. Yeah. Um, so the whole book is from the perspective of this this kind of psycho controlling person, um, which kind of to me sort of breaks one of the rules that, that I feel is quite important, which is you know the characters need to be uh, relatable, that you have this empathetic um, you know lead character who is you know I think our, our, our lead, let's assume that that was a special case. Okay, so we're going to talk about a psychological thriller where the reader. Is thinking, oh my God, you know, that could be me. How would I cope if that happened to me? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we feel that person as, as someone we could be like. And, and I read a great, great quote today, which was that um, we haven't necessarily experienced their situation, but we have experienced their emotions. So hopefully, yeah, right? So, you know, I mean, I, I'm really pleased that I've never had a stalker or a home invasion, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, if that if having a stalker made you anxious or worried or depressed, well, we've all had those sorts of emotions. So, so we have this kind of character, I think, who, as you say, they're not a billionaire. They are a. Um, I mean, my protagonist, she's an advertising executive. In fact, she kind of used to be. She's given up her job to to raise her baby. Um, 
I've just been, I'm watching this amazing movie um, it kind of preparation with the machinist with Christian Bale and he is just works in a machine shop making you know tools making things on a lathe so he's like the ultimate everyman um, and I think again that's very important because the, what happens to these people has to feel like kind of everyday life I think only with some malevolent God which is actually you or me or one of our kind of listeners here turning up the pressure you know yeah. dial whatever the dial is that says you know we're going to screw up your life let's turn that right up to 10. and i want to i want to chase down though something you said but then you drop it but i do think as soon as you said it, it it you're right in that a lot of times in psychological thrillers it might might even be majority of the time the protagonist is often the villain or has some sort of role in in the you know, disaster that is unfolding. Um, and when I think about, I don't want to spoil anything, but when I think about the biggest hits of psychological fiction lately, almost almost all of them at the end, the main character ended up being the bad guy or to be at fault or evil, you know, in some yeah. way. And, and, and uh, I come from a world of romance, so it was really freeing for me to write psychological thrillers because I could make the main characters bad i could make them unlikable um you know in gone girl i mean we hate most of the people in that book um but obviously that was a book that readers loved um mm. so uh i think and most of gillian flynn's books are like that but i but i i would almost say that that is a common thread is that the protagonist is oftentimes not heroic um mm. and if anything oftentimes can be villainous um but they don't necessarily know it and they don't necessarily see themselves i mean the the rule of thumb is also always right like the villain the best villains i mean think that they are heroes in their own way yeah um, i think i mean exactly we're not uh i mean when i write i mean i taught to write creatively being you know, everything i've read and, and learned and, and and figured out myself and taught myself you know we hear this sort of golden rule which is give your villains virtues and your heroes flaws and i i think that's very important you know even more so with with psychological thrillers that if you just have a villain who is completely evil yeah you know a a, a sort of you know malevolent you know force of nature then it's kind of it's kind of boring right yeah boring. I mean, you know i was say malaria is, is like you know if you make your villain like malaria right or or like a tsunami uh -huh. then it's or an, or an asteroid sort of streaking towards it there's you can't understand malaria you can't empathize why is malaria killing millions of children in the third world i don't know it's just what malaria does right but if you if you have um so you have to make your 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 kind of antagonist. Oh, I think we've just lost Alessandra there. Are you, are you still there? Okay, Alessandra, we've just lost her. I all keep talking, vamping. So I think that um, when you have a, a the antagonist, let's say that the person causing all the trouble in the protagonist's life, we often get some chapters, some sections from their point of view. And that's a chance for us to understand how they see the world you know, from their perspective. And if you've, there's a book I really recommend, it's called The Psychopath Whisperer. And it's a, a book by the guy who essentially and literally wrote the book on, on sort of psychopathy and developed the, the hair psychopathy checklist. And when he interviews psychopaths in prison or in secure psychiatric hospitals, you know, these guys were not kind of like ravening werewolves. They were not completely mad and bonkers and and they would justify themselves you know and, and often you know they would have had an incredibly violent or abusive childhood so in a sense you could understand you know from their perspective you you know why they are behaving like this you know perhaps it's not fair you know the world is, is not fair i haven't been treated well why should i treat anyone else the same way um, but in fact, yeah, we can we can go be even more subtle. I think with the with the antagonist and say that they are um, they don't really realise that they're bad, you know, or they're lying to us. They're lying to justify their their behaviour, and so we don't really know who to believe. Um, so so this kind of interplay really between the protagonist and the antagonist, I think, is is absolutely critical that we keep the reader on the back foot and we're, they're never really sure who to believe. 
so let's say we've got this kind of every man, every woman hero. It, one of the things I think we need to do is to really paint a detailed and kind of believable picture of their of their life, you know, the, their internal life in particular. So well, what's going on in their brain, but also their world. So if, if, as in, you know, my book, uh, You're Always With Me, we have the lead character being a, um, hi, we're back. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just I'm now using I'm... my hotspot on my phone. I, <laughs> I have no idea what happened to my internet. No um, worries. So I, I've just been talking about. Um, that hilarious. Yeah, malaria, well, malaria personified. Okay, so in fact, not that. So, you know, how the villain from their perspective has every reason to behave the way they're behaving. Um, and I'm just saying that for the, in order for us to relate to the protagonist, if we use that word or the victim character, we need to believe their world needs to be fully believed, you know, fully realized. So, I mean, in fantasy, we talk a lot about, you know, world building and sci-fi world building you know if you want to paint a if you want to destroy someone's cozy domesticity well you have to invest some time in creating that cozy domesticity in the first place mm -hmm. um and you know i think you know I, well, I think i did write a blog post for authors ai about stephen king and his influence on my writing and one of the things i said and i think is absolutely you know, nobody does it better in my opinion is that he will make sure that you care about every single character on the page, even if they're about to be horribly wiped out, which they usually are, right? Yeah. I would venture to say almost especially if they're about to be horribly yeah, wiped out. Yeah, I mean, that's a good tip, right? If you're reading a Stephen King novel and you really like somebody, it's kind of, oh my God, you know, they, they've got two pages left. So, so you know if in my case you know if, if it's a young mum, you know what's the color of the nursery you know what sounds does the baby make or or you know it's not just got stuff on its face it's got porridge or banana so so it's that real kind of detail i think so that we start to well we know we're reading a psychological thriller so we know stuff's going to go wrong but the, the the more perfect it looks the kind of more tense we are becoming I think that we know at some point something's going to go wrong um and that again that that tension starts to feed in right from the very beginning yeah and tension that's another thing on psychological thrillers you want to keep that tension high you know yeah. so it isn't um it's almost constant i mean you you want to give the readers a break but tension is another thing that is um you want to keep an eye on and stephen king does a great job of doing that yeah. Even even with his, he's very descriptive and everything else, and he still manages to, yeah. Well, I think, one, I mean, one of the things that I find good with with um, this sort of genre, I mean, the tension is, um, you kind of can't escape it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like in, in the action thrillers I write, you've got, uh, in the one that's coming out on Monday, um, there's a scene, and this is not a spoiler, but, you know, there's a guy driving a Lamborghini down a canyon, you know, sort of ravine road, there's, there's a guy up on a hill who's about to fire an RPG at him. And, you know, there is a sort of tension, there's this approaching collision, but he could just turn the car around and go the other way. He could escape or he could just not go to Serbia in the first place. But if the threat is happening in your own home, mm -hmm. you you know, what are you gonna do? There's this sort of, and there's this word, I, I like this sort of insidious, the, the threat is very insidious. It's it's there. It's somebody comes to the door and they're selling, you know, Girl Scout cookies or whatever it might be, and they say, "Oh, you know, I really need the toilet. You know, could I come in and use your bathroom?" You go, well, "Of course you can." And you're like, Ooh. you know, <laughs> and then they're in the house, and then you know, why won't they go? You know, and and then something else happens, and you and you you see this kind of person. You know, oh yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, of course you can use the phone. And I've just got to go and a little it's... bit, a little bit. Yeah, and a in little, an action little, little. thriller, the guy would just be like, "Get out of here!" <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he's he... pull a big gun, you know. <laughs> right, but Slow. that's a great point. But in a in a psychological suspense or psychological fiction, yeah, you're inside their head, and it's an ordinary person. Yeah, and we've mm -hmm. all been in that uncomfortable situation where it's like, gosh, like at some point, am I going to have to ask this person to leave? And yeah. I. I'm not that I, I don't think I could even do that. Like it would be a hard for me as a person. Well, I, do yeah. you know what I mean? I think that is, I mean, a great example of a sort of prompt, you know, is like imagine you're in your home, 
somebody comes to the door and for whatever reason you invite them in and now you have to get them out again yeah. what do you do if they kind of don't want to go how would you get you know you don't have you to have in my guest room by the end of it like <laughs> i mean you can't you're not going to fight them right because this is real life you know this is a real house you can't just pull a gun or a knife or a baseball bat they're not a zombie yeah they're not a superhero they're just like a normal person i'll give you an example actually from my own, own life that that could very easily have, have turned the wrong way um when i used to live in, in in london um i was working at home during the day there was a knock on the door and i opened the gut and there's a guy there with a kind of metal billy can you know um a little sort of food tin and he's a builder working next door um and he said can you can you heat up my lunch for me <laughs> i was like what <laughs> yeah you know can you heat up my lunch? So, uh, okay so so i mean okay so you know because what do you, you can't say no what do you even say yeah even though it seems like a ridiculous request i did say you know can you just wait there yeah and i just shut the door but do you know what it's my house even shutting the door on this complete stranger felt like i was transgressing mm -hmm. some unspoken social rule and I went and heated up and gave it back to him and it was all fine. It was just a normal guy doing a thing and, you know, he didn't think there was any problem with it. <laughs> but if he yeah. said, oh, would you mind if I came in and waited? Yeah. And then it's like, well, I guess not. Or I've really got to use the restroom. Like, what do you say, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but then if you switch back into psychological thriller author mode and say, and actually let's make this guy some kind of, you know, psychopath, mm -hmm. now you're in big trouble yeah and uh, so i think this idea of uh, reality being subverted and your protagonist let we'll stick with the idea they're the, the good person you're not perfect but so they do a perfectly normal thing but the odds are the you know that the other the other character isn't playing by the same set of rules mm -hmm. and that in itself is a great setup which is why I think there's a lot of thrillers, you know, with house guests. In fact, you know, um, my friend Mark Edwards actually has a book called The House Guest. But the, again, we're back to that idea we touched on last time with the, the domestic setting. I think because it is so familiar to all of us, we don't, I mean, we talk about burglars and car crashes, but we never really think that's going to happen to us. And then, yeah, yeah, know, absolutely. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think I was trying to think um, we had a guest on first off Friday, Tex Thompson, who's a fantastic um, book guru, for lack of a better term. I, I think she has a different term for herself, but she was also talking about when you're putting your characters in these uncomfortable situations. Um, don't make it easy on them. Right. If there's like you said, your guy driving down the ravine, he could just turn around and go back. But, you know, um, if you're talking about domestic setting why you know someone knocks on the door they ask to use your phone um and create def create a situation that enhances that that stress for some reason or another maybe she has a baby sleeping in the next room maybe she was in the middle of hiding something you know but whatever you can do to kind of turn up i think you said like turn up the um heat on the yeah. kettle kettle that they're cooking in but um but yeah make it make your characters lives you know, more difficult. And it's a temptation, I think, that, that we all have. I know I, I very much do, which is you get the, oh, factor. Oh, yeah. where it's like, oh, let's bring them together. You know, I mean, if you're writing a rom-com or a romance, which I never have done, but, you know, I would be thinking, well, in fact, the best things like when Harry met Sally, you know, you're constantly driving a wedge between them. Mm -hmm. I mean, with that kind of story, the, the tension is a kind of erotic sort of romantic tension. And eventually it's resolved by bringing them together. Um, but I think with psychological thrillers, like like any kind of thriller, really, you're constantly thinking, OK, well, if she just did that, that would be fine. Let's do the opposite of that. Or she's just about to take the key and it goes down the drain or whatever it might be. And in fact, I just in a comment from Margaret Daly, he says, as a reader, knowing I, I'm reading a psychological thriller, I'd be screaming, no, don't let them in. And that, again, is something we, we I think, talked briefly about last time, this idea of the, the, the poor decision making, poor choices. Mm -hmm. You know, the simplest way to make, a, you know, your protagonist's life difficult is when they should say yes, make them say no. Or when they should say no, make them say yes. You know, they, they think it's their best range. reason to be doing yeah. that. 
you know, whether it's their backstory or their personality or I think one of the best things, my first traditional publisher editor, you know, my first big editor, um, I had a, a very convenient story where my heroine was, um, you know, eavesdropping on this guy or something. I can't even remember what it was, but she said she introduced me to um, TSTL syndrome, which is too stupid to live. And <laughs> at some point your readers go, this character is just too stupid to live. And they stop caring about them because they're yeah. making so many stupid decisions, you know, that yeah. you're just like, why is she going down that dark stairway where there's somebody groaning, you know, <laughs> screaming, mm. help me at the bottom. Like uh, at some point you have to, you know, you, and not at some point you need to make your characters relatable and you need to make them fairly intelligent and put them in those situations because they truly don't have another option or because there's a very valid reason for them to be making those bad decisions, which are then going to trigger all of these yeah. other and I, I think that that sort of too stupid to live um, potentially leads to another sort of trap for the unwary writer. Because if you think about horror films, the, the first sort of generation of all those teen screens like Friday the 13th uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, Halloween, it's there. You now, isn't there a sort of trope now or a meme called The Last Girl? Where, you know, you're the last girl standing, you know, all the others have been horribly murdered and, and you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, you know. Uh, you you have to sort of be the one who fights off the the serial killer, and then you've got this these sort of postmodern um, kind of thrillers like Scream, I think, um, mm -hmm. where they were actually starting to acknowledge in a very sort of ironic '90s yeah. way <laughs> the whole thing is that oh, you know right. what this means. What the hell are you doing? You're the last girl, and, which is okay. I mean, it kind of works, but I always feel with with fiction, you know, with with on the page or the the, the Kindle screen. I don't, well, I personally, I don't want the author deconstruct, having the characters deconstruct the genre for me as they're going. And, and the worst, and the trap is where people said, do you know what, if this was a book, I wouldn't even believe this. And so that is just too knowing. And yeah. the author is too clever to live, really, not too stupid to live. You know, you, you need to risk, I do this, you know, I think we need to resist the temptation to have, characters in a novel saying wow this is just like a this is just like the girl on the train i mean you you've yeah. got to play it straight yeah i don't play fair with the reader yeah and uh another great comment from margaret and it's very similar to you i don't know if you've seen this ad on tv but you know there's like a killer coming over and uh the guy's like why don't you just get in the car and drive away and she's like no let's hide behind this wall of bloody chainsaw <laughs> <laughs> like, um and and that's right in there but yeah we definitely don't want to we don't want to do that in our books um yeah. so i mean on the subject of the kind of crimes and you know the, the kind of bloody chainsaws and all the rest of it one of the things that um i no, I mean, I wouldn't say I struggled with it. I enjoyed was was figuring out the relationship between the protagonist, the antagonist and the police. If you've got this kind of love triangle, if you like, mm -hmm. because, you know, obviously with a police procedural, the it's from the police perspective. Everything is true, except that possibly, you know, one of the suspects is lying to the police in the interview. And that's kind of fun in its own way. But with a psychological thriller, you know, the police are not the kind of focus, I think. Right. And, you know, they're not, if it was cosy mystery, the police kind of bumblers, right. you know, yeah. they, they stamp around the place, getting it wrong, being a bit hopeless and, you know, plucky, you know, plucky Jill, the, the homemaker sleuths around and figures out and, you know, the, and, you know, that goes back way back to sort of, you know, Lestrade of the old Sherlock Holmes. I think in, in psychological thrillers, the cops are more like everyday people. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're sort of in the background. We see them from the protagonist's point of view. So they may be instrumental in, in the plot, but we don't really focus on forensics and all of that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, it's, it's still very much about dialogue and the police sort of, you know, they're all, I think they can be like a Greek chorus. You know, they're helping us interrogate what we're being told is whether it's true or false, which, you know, I said last time, I, I like to have the police in the third person because for me then they are, you know, this is one anchor point that whatever the police see, we see, and that is actually happening. 
So it's a kind of a way for them to play a role. Um, but yeah. you don't want to follow them around the whole time because then all the unreliability sort of goes out the window. And I think, and it's funny, when you're an author, you read read books differently, right? So a lot yeah. of times when I am reading psychological suspense or psychological thrillers, um, and I there is a primary police officer in first person especially, I'm I'm almost me like, oh, well, he's obviously got to be bad. You know what I mean? It's like, like there's no reason why this why this author is moving into this head. And it's not a rule. It's not a rule that you have to have your police in third person or that you can't. No, no. But the genre norm is to avoid the all of those details of cop life and of forensics and of that sort of that's really when you kind of wander in police procedural um and yeah uh heidi says keep the reader guessing who is lying to the police i like that um i like that comment but i yeah, but um, i agree normally the police are kind of on the on the side and they help feed information to the story and you know validate yeah. information and um and help the reader along but oftentimes they're not a primary character yeah they're, they're almost like a mirror or a, a kind of reflecting pool but through which, you know, because I think, you know, this is a puzzle, it's a form of puzzle book, I think. And, you know, we're trying, I love to try and figure out what's going on. You know, that's why we read these kind of books or partly, or it's one of the pleasures of reading a psychological thriller is trying to solve it just before the end, or, you know, before we're given the final piece of the puzzle, the final breadcrumb. And one of the things I notice when I'm writing books, because they're like, you know, you know everything, you know where it all, everything is, but you kind of forget that, you know, in a, say, a 80, 90,000 word manuscript, readers have short memories. So what I like to do is have a character say, say or do something on, the, you know, page five. And then when they're asked about it by a police officer on page 95 or 200, they lie. Yeah. And if you're paying attention, you go, hang on a minute. Yeah. That, I love that. I love that. That doesn't work. So... And I, I think this is another one of those kind of rules or guidelines that you have to play fair with the reader. Mm -hmm. You cannot just withhold information that should have come out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, everything has to be there, more or less in plain sight. And there's a, there's a book I really recommend called, I think it's called How to Write a Thriller by Patricia Highsmith, uh, you know, who wrote the Mr. Ripley, talented Mr. Ripley. She gave this great example of putting a massive clue absolutely front and center and everybody misses it. And the the the, the big clue is that the killer is short sighted, okay? And if we I can't remember like, why but... like short sighted um mentally or he literally No no no, no like, like like myopia. Near sighted. Okay. Yeah near sighted, or... sorry. British English. Near sighted. Yeah. <laughs> we say short sighted. Um and so basically if we know who's short sighted that's it, mystery over. And the detective is interviewing the domestic staff in this house about dates, okay? Where were you on Friday the 13th of July? And the housemaid goes like this. I have to make sure I find some in shot. Um, she kind of squints and kind of goes, Friday the 13th, oh, I was here. And you, what you pay attention to is her did not, you know, saying I was here on the 13th. What you should be, she's squinting. <laughs> or she brings the camera. Oh, I, the, love that. I know, right? And it's just such a clever thing. And you, you do it in movies. You see it a lot in movies where with a little bit of misdirection, which is, yeah. could be another. They're distracting you with this big shiny thing. Yeah, when, look, look yeah, shiny thing. Huge clue is right yeah. there. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I love things like that. And almost, you know, the. It's how audacious are you prepared to be? You know, make the clue bigger and shinier and brighter and ob more and more obvious, but then put um, something in the foreground, basically, yeah. moving about, uh, you know, and people notice the thing moving about and the huge clue is just sort of gone. Yeah, and Peg said that Ag Agatha Christie was a master of that. Um, we are already out of time. Oh, uh, <laughs> I know. I know. Um, we did. I did want to because I think this is a great question, and I have a great what I think is a great answer. But we did have a question, which is, what is your favorite psychological thriller, movie or book, not including your own? And for me, uh, Silence of the Lambs 
was such a fantastic movie. To be honest, I've not read the book, um, but I love how that story unfolded. And that's one where we, we talk about cops. There were cops and it was a, a, a serial killer investigation, but you really never even saw much of that other than like, you know, the butterflies being or the yeah. moths being investigated. But really the focus was on the psychology and on her, you know, sort of almost amateur sleuth, you know, activity yeah. that was separate from the police investigation. So, um, so that's my, that's my favorite. And it's one I use all the time when I'm using examples for psychological fiction. I think it's a great example and it shows how broad the term is or the genre mm -hmm. and mine i am going to go for what i i hope is a little known um gem a movie uh a tim robbins film called jacob's ladder oh i have i've i've heard of it but i haven't seen oh, it mind-blowing yeah. it's suspenseful it, it's sus it's it's very very suspenseful uh -huh. it, it's a vietnam vet uh who gets medevaced back to the States and he's in this weird hospital. There's elements of horror. It's very disturbing. You really don't know what's going on. And the, 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 the twist is off the scale. You know, it's 25 on a one to 10 scale. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch it this weekend. Oh God, yeah. Jacob's I'm Ladder. Sure it. Yeah. I've heard of it, but I've never, it's like, yeah. I don't know anything about it. Um, I about the name 30 years sounds ago. like contemporary fiction. You know, it doesn't sound, yeah. Margaret said that movie is crazy. Oh my there gosh, ladder. All right, I have my homework assignment for the weekend. <laughs> but, um, but this is a wrap. So we are going to sign off um, for everyone watching. If you're watching on um, Facebook, please join the group. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you're listening on our podcast, please subscribe. It's been great to have you guys. Thank you so much, Andy, for coming back and yeah. sharing. Um, sharing your wisdom. And if they are interested in reading your books, um, would they visit andymaslin.com? What is your Yep, yeah. they're, they're all there or, or your local Amazon store is where they mm -hmm. all are. Perfect. And best of luck with your uh, publisher submission. Yeah, yeah. As so I say, I'm excited to see it. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in trying out our uh, artificial intelligence fiction editor, uh, visit authorsday.ai and check out Marlo. Um, she has some really exciting updates coming in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So I can't wait for you guys to check her out. All right, we're signing off. Thank you guys for watching First Draft Friday.